as I mentioned in the introduction to uh, Dr. Heitz, I'm Lee Valentine. I'm the Executive Vice President of the Space Studies Institute in Princeton. And as most of you probably know, we've been involved for the last three decades in trying to find some way to settle certain solar space. And I would like to talk today about what we ought to be doing in space and how we ought to be doing it. I would like to talk about an evolutionary, uh, an evolutionary effort uh, that will bring about the kinds of things that we all want to see. I would like to talk about a roadmap that will enable us step by step to defend the Earth, to mine the sky, and to settle the universe. The moon is close to space, and the asteroids are resources already in space. Free space is where the energy is, and that is where we should settle. Next, you grab, please. Tsiolkovsky's radical idea is that free space is the natural home of a technological species, and in the future, most pe human beings will not live on the surface of the Earth, but will inhabit free space colonies in orbit about the sun. Next, you grab. Early colony designs required technology standard in bridge building perhaps three decades ago. The difficulty is to make the transition from a bureaucratic government program aimed at defeating a, our political rival in a war with no blood to a profit-driven uh, evolutionary program uh, that allows freedom of uh, opportunity and latitude for individual expression. So we need to de derive uh, or devise a way to make a profit, have a commercially driven enterprise that provides space transportation to, for cargo and private astronauts and other goods and services demanded by the market, whatever that is. Next slide, please. Next slide. There are really three rationales for macro engineering projects. The first is warfare, and that could be exemplified by the Great Wall of China. Another is as a monument to power, and those pyramids would exemplify that. And it's interesting that the progression from this very smallest pyramid in the foreground to the very largest pyramid at Giza was only a few centuries, and after that they stopped doing it. And that provides us an exact parallel with the Apollo project, where in rapid succession, a series of vehicles was developed, culminating in the Saturn V vehicle that uh, took uh, Rusty into Was Saturn V Rusty? Yeah. Yeah, it was a Saturn V. It took Rusty into orbit. And then from then, they gradually declined until now the, the, largest, the largest pyramid was reached and none subsequently were built. <coughs> Large government, uh, or the, the, and of course the final uh, rationale for a macro-engineering macro project is to make a profit, and that's exemplified by the Boeing 747, but there are lo lots of other macro-engineering projects that make profits. Railroads make profits, steam lines make profits, uh, the, telephone system and all communication systems make project, make profits, and all of those are macro-engineering projects. Government programs, next year graph please, are poorly suited to reach that goal, and the reason they're poorly suited is they suffer from parasitism. As soon as some money is available, other people want a piece of it. They suffer from bureaucratic capture. Once you have a number of bureaucrats ensconced in office, they need to justify their jobs, and they're more happy to, more than happy to add costs, irrespective of whether they are achieving anything. And the last is political interference. You know, we have to we have to launch on a certain date because someone's giving a speech on that date, and it would be a suitable backdrop for that operation. So it's useful to re remember, though, that the, that the infrastructure of our country was built bit by bit, 
primarily by private enterprise. And I'm suggesting that that's the way we really should do space. Next few graphs. This is, uh, unfortunately, you can't see very well what this is. This is an Intel fab that cost uh, several billion dollars to construct. The initial capitalization of the Intel Corporation was $50,000 in 1968. Uh, that just goes to show you that things can start small and over three decades can grow quite large. In 1968, our government pro promised us affordable space transportation in 30 years. Uh, next few uh, graphs, please. So the, the challenge is to find a path that allows us to start <coughs> with a relatively small investment. Uh, so what we're trying to uh, find is a way that, can, that we can break down this investment into smaller steps and make a profit at each and every step of the way. And uh, Elon Musk earlier today talked about his plan for doing just that. It's become conventional wisdom that space has to be expensive and it has to be uh, so difficult that only governments can engage in it. And much of that perceived difficulty is just people's ex experience with that program uh, where the engines were developed to power military missiles. There's a great deal of difference between the kind of optimization that you do for something that you want to reuse for thousands of times and have it reliably work for thousands of full duration burns and something that you're going to use only once where you'd like to maximize the tonnage of explosive you deliver to uh, your opponent's country. So it's only been, next few graph, the last five years that, uh, that cheap, safe, and reliable, and highly reusable rocket engines have been developed. And the en this engine over here apparently will go for thousands of full duration burns, uh, hundreds of hours of operation, uh, needs its seals to be changed every so and so many hours of operation. Uh, cheap and reliable space transportation is fundamental to all progress in space development, all near-term projects. With it, all the things that I'm going to talk about will be possible, and without it, they'll be very difficult and expensive to achieve. What I'm going to suggest is that the kind of space tourism that Bert Rutan talked about at lunch will provide the evolutionary path and provide sufficient capital through the generation of profits to, uh, to retrace the kind of transportation evolution that we've seen in highways and in railroads and in ships and in the aircraft. Space tourism does more than that. Next few graphs. It provides an economic reason to develop a closed, robust closed environment life support system to provide air, food, and uh, water for space hotels. In 1982, Boeing conducted a study that suggested that any manned space uh, mission that lasted longer than five years would benefit from having a closed system that provided at least 97% uh, of the air, food, and, and water. It, it seems to me that any space, space hotel will last at least that long, and that therefore, as a baseline, any space hotel should incorporate a closed environment life support system. This, of course, would be true of any uh, permanent installation on the moon or other celestial bodies. <coughs> Space hotels may also provide an early market for non-terrestrial water. And I would be remiss if I said that an adequate supply of lunar water would revolutionize the cost of transportation between the Earth and the Moon, so that if we expect to extend tourism to the Moon, uh, lunar resources may be very important. It may not only be lunar resources, it may be asteroidal water 
that's important depending on where we can find the asteroids and how difficult it might be to engineer bringing water back. Next paragraph. Next graph. So th these are economic drivers. Uh, tourism is probably the first and probably the most important because that's a near-term market and should provide, we hope, enough profit to allow us to get to orbit with a reusable system that is also profitable carrying people into orbit. Uh, another economic driver, of course, is energy supply of the Earth, platinum group metals, and finally, on-orbit assembly. Uh, next few graphs. Uh, the uh, next few graph, please. The ISS now is only a monument to power. If it's to serve as a beachhead on a high frontier, we've got to find more ways than sending uh, private astronauts to it to uh, to have it pay for itself. So I'm going to suggest that we undertake to learn how to assemble application satellites in orbit. And I would just mention that the Japanese uh, S, uh, SPS 2000 project, which was a demonstration solar power satellite project, foundered because they could not arrange for uh, on-orbit assembly uh, of, their, of their demonstration satellite. I'm going to suggest that much of the cost of uh, satellites that uh, uh, Dr. Heiss mentioned is because those satellites must withstand the rigors of launch and they must be able to self-deploy. If you relax those two constraints, you may be able to relax the cost by a large factor, but that requires on-orbit assembly. Similarly, to build very large structures in space, like the ISS, also requires assembly. And so the larger communication satellites, both in low Earth orbit and in geosynchronous orbit, might best be constructed by using on-orbit assembly. Space has enormous advantages over planetary surfaces for the construction of all sorts of large space structures. Uh, of course, there is full-time solar energy for both electricity and process heat, and the hard vacuum makes possible processes that are very difficult and expensive to achieve on the surface of the Earth. It makes possible things like very high-performance solar sails, which must be constructed in space from vapor-deposited aluminum because they are too flimsy to self-deploy. Next view, Graham, please. People worry about energy on the surface of the Earth. Well, the sun puts out so much energy that it's very difficult to convey. Those zeros, of course, I had that slide was initially 3 times 10 to the 14, which is, I think, the right number. I'm not really sure that it makes any difference whether it's 3 times 10 to the 14, 3 times 10 to the 10th, or whatever. The point is that the quantity is enormous compared to the amount that we use on the Earth. If you consider a, a, a band of uh, geostationary orbit, the energy flux through that is about 2,500 terawatts. Last year's energy consumption rate worldwide was 12 terawatts, and we need 20 or so by 2050 to ensure uh, a standard of living commensurate with the United States in these days. Uh, Next view graph, please. The cost of satellite solar power, such as we now have powering geostationary communication satellites, is dominated by the launch cost. And that gives us good reason to think about non-terrestrial resources. Nearly all the mass of a solar power satellite can be constructed from lunar material or other non-terrestrial materials. It's possible that a Brayton cycle turbine constructed of asteroidal steel might be much cheaper than a photovoltaic design. And if you can find an asteroid made of the right stuff in the right orbit and configure a way to drag it back, that might be the way to do it. Uh, I would point out that uh, a 100 meter nickel steel asteroid, if you can find a way to cut it up, 
It has enough material in it to make 85 gigawatt power stations. That's a lot of energy. Uh, so we would advocate uh, continued pursuit of the integration of non-terrestrial materials into design of satellite solar power stations for clean energy on the surface of the Earth. Next view graph, please. One thing is certain, though, we don't have processes adequately developed to use these non-terrestrial materials, and that is a purview of NASA to, uh, to assist in the development of those kinds of uh, processes and uh, techniques. I think we can imagine a point in, at the future, at some time in the future, where manufacturing uh, costs in space should be similar to manufacturing costs on the surface of the Earth. Uh, shortly thereafter, though, it's possible to see that those manufacturing costs for certain kinds of goods might be even lower than they are on the surface of the Earth, since one of the primary inputs, energy, should always be less expensive in space than it is on the ground. Next, next view. Graph. Now I'd like to shift gears a little bit and talk about one thing that we must do, we, no matter what else we do in space. And, and we don't have to do a whole, whole heck of a lot. We don't have to. It's convenient to have, have uh, uh, weather satellites. It's convenient to have communication satellites. But one thing we must do is, uh, is prevent asteroid and comet impacts with, with, uh, with our planet. Near-Earth asteroids are a resource. Uh, the number of them was really not well characterized until the last two decades. And what was a trickle of discoveries uh, initiated by Spacewatch, which SSI helped to initiate, uh, has become a flood and will become a deluge as PanStars comes online. So it's, uh, it's both an opportunity and, uh, and a threat. Deflection technology options like mass drivers and solar thermal rockets and solar sails are also technologies that improve deep space transportation and allow us to bring materials back from the asteroids as well as to deflect it. Uh, so these transportation technologies are dual use. Uh, they serve to s supply materials for all the purposes that we think about space hotels and power satellites and other possible uses. Uh, recent research has shown that, that uh, there are objects in the L4, L5, Earth-Sun uh, in orbit about those Lagrange points, and those should be relatively easy, or material from them should be relatively easy to return to a uh, high Earth orbit using uh, uh, a weak stability boundary uh, and lunar uh, flyby uh, orbit. So, in total there are something like 5,000 metallic asteroids uh, crossing, crossing Earth, uh, Earth's orbit and there will be no need to go to the main belt for materials for a long time to come. Uh, next uh, view graph please. So the question is, can we discover a path that allows us to defend the Earth, to provide clean energy, to settle the solar system, and to begin our exploration of the rest of the universe? An energy regime in the next 40 years that's powered from space and perhaps uses platinum group metals to enable a hydrogen-mediated economy. I'm not sure I believe in a hydrogen economy, but there's, there are certainly lots of platinum in asteroids. Next, next regret. Find the advantages of place of space over planetary surfaces. There is full-time solar energy, <coughs> solar process heat. Vacuum processes are relatively easy. There are near-term benefits to assembling satellites in space. And NEO resources discovered since Apollo are enormous. Next regret. 
So the summary is this preservation and prosperity of humanity on the Earth and a settlement of space is our goal. Space tourism will drive transportation costs down. Space hotels will be a real market. Non-terrestrial materials are key to opening the high frontier. We should use the advantages of space because they, they are, there are advantages. We do need deep, new deep space transportation modes. Uh, mining and fabrication technology needs development. Advanced robotics will increase our productivity and this path, the good news is, this path requires much less capital investment than the original SSI plan to get the government interested in investing in rapid fire billions of dollars to build power satellites and space settlements in tandem. Uh, I'm now convinced that that, even if we could convince them to do it, they would not be able to. Thanks very much. <laughs> any, uh, any questions on that religious? Uh... <laughs> Yes. Uh, I'd like to hear more on your thoughts about the challenges in the fabrication technology that you say makes development. Well, there there are uh, when you get any sort of native material, like for example, the stuff on the moon. There are many different mineral species in that moon moon dust. Uh, it's not very good to use for anything except shielding. It's not too hard to use that. You can pile it up over, over your igloo or what when you get to the moon, and that provides, that gives you a way to use resources without doing much to them. But once you want to do things like build pressure vessels or build trusses, then you have to have a material that, will, that has certain properties that will do that. So you have to separate out, let's say, the iron and find a way to make that iron into something that it has properties that are suitable to construct what you want to build. Because you can't just go there and dig a chunk and, and, and have make something out of it. Now we did develop a couple of different ways uh, that should be relatively easy to build some kind of simple things that don't have that don't require very high strengths or those kinds of things. Uh, we developed a way to make the soft fibers from uh, from the sort of random uh, lunar dust. Uh, that process has been commercialized and the Chinese are now going to build, use the salt fibers to reinforce their highways. Uh, another example is if you really wanted to undertake this idea to build uh, uh, Brayton cycle turbines, which are very similar to, or uh, they have a turbine engine, they spin a generator, and fluid flows around and, and uh, gets heated up and cooled down and, and you generate electricity by running a, a turbine using heat from the sun, I would say. Uh, but to make, that, to make that turbine, you have to have uh, materials that, will, that have certain properties that will withstand certain temperatures, you can form them, they don't deform, and so on. So even though you might get a very nice grade of nickel steel from an asteroid, it's got impurities in it, you have to find a way to get those out. And if you're going to use this asteroid, you've got to find a way to cut it up into pieces because they, we think some of them come in fairly large chunks of pretty solid metal, and that's tough to figure out how to get them into usable pieces. Does that sort of get, get, give you a flavor of what? And in the actual fabrication process, you do I mean, you know, you mentioned cutting, you mentioned forming, um, uh, and attaching. That is still more traditional. The thought is still more traditional, or, or will the materials drive what the fabrication process is? Uh, I, I think the materials may drive what the fabrication processes are. Remember that some of the fabrication that we do really requires gravity or requires other things that, that are not around in the space environment. And we have other things that do happen like vacuum welding of metals that don't really occur on them. So there, there are a lot of nuances. I, I, I think that, that there ought to be ways to do it, but uh, they do require some validation. Yes? Can you tell us a little bit more about the pan stars and why you think that will help discover any more asteroids? Oh, gee, I, I, I wish I hadn't mentioned pan stars now. Um, 
because I don't recall all the details. Uh, it's uh, run by the military. It's got a large focal plane array. Uh, I think there will be four telescopes when it's all up and running. And uh, Rusty, do you, do you have a better answer than that? You probably yeah, follow that a little closer. The question is, you're interested in the discovery rate. What you, what you can talk about in the next uh, 15 years is going from 4,000 known near Earth asteroids, which we have in the database today, to something like uh, 40,000, or excuse me, 400,000 asteroids. You're talking about a factor of 100 increase in the discovery rate over the next um, decade, decade and a half. Now, PanStar is really just one of the first of the new generation of telescopes uh, that's going to be increasing that. Uh, discovery capability. Uh, LSST is another and there will be follow-ons. In fact, NASA is about to go out with a, an invitation for recommendations of how to meet the congressional goal. But uh, in any event, uh, we'll basically see a factor of 100 increase in almost all the categories that we have today of the Earth Any more? Does that mean that the uh, diameter will be also reduced by a factor of 100? Like if it's, you're picking up half a mile now, it'd be like a like 100 feet or something? Yeah. yeah. All right. That gets it down to the almost below the level of a city buster. Well, I, you know, that's also true today. I mean, we, you know, yeah. we, we discovered accidentally six meter, 10 meter asteroids. Right. Uh, right. But it's only when they come very close to the Earth that we're it, able to see them. So. That's right. It's just accidental. That's right. You want to be able to the survey goal, the whole The space. goal of the new program will be 140 meters versus one kilometer. Yeah. But as a consequence of that, we will also be discovering a higher percentage of the smaller ones. But when they get below 60 meters or so, we don't really much care about them. Right. All right.